Several churches are stepping up to help survivors of Hurricane Florence. They're bursting with donations as they come in at one Newport News church. And that's why city leaders come in. They'll provide a big truck to deliver the donations to North Carolina this weekend. Reporter Nico Clemens has the story. Lending a helping hand. We just want to make sure we take care of those in need. Several churches coming together to help those just hours away. It just shows the love that people really care about other people. It's been two weeks since Florence pounded the Carolinas and the need for supplies is still growing. Pastor Willard Maxwell in New Beach Grove Baptist Church in Newport News are sending off an 18 wheeler Saturday morning with everything you can imagine. Water, food, baby supplies. And it's not just New Beach Grove. They're teamed alongside the Tidewater Peninsula Baptist Association, which is comprised of 50 churches in the Hampton Roads area. All of our churches kind of pull together. Maxwell says they're sending a first truck to a church in North Carolina. They plan to send another truck in about a week. Maxwell says they wanted to send money. But the people there said many of the shelves were empty and money would do them no good. For people to turn down money means they're really hurting because they said nothing is on the shelves. The city is also getting involved, providing the truck to take the supplies down to North Carolina. City leaders provided transportation to New Beach Grove before, when Pastor Maxwell and his congregation sent more than 160,000 pounds of water to Flint, Michigan. Jesus, he did most of his ministry outside of the church walls. Um, so I believe we're supposed to always go to the highways and byways making sure that we take care of people who are less fortunate. Helping those in need, no matter where they are. Hey, how you doing, everybody? As you can hear the noise behind me, we're out here working, making sure that we get supplies to those in need in the Carolinas. Okay, we're going to take, uh, we're going to put two more waters and then we're going to fill it out with boxes if we got them. Right now, we're in a series called Matters of the Heart. And tomorrow's lesson and other lessons, one of them is going to be, do you, who do you love more, the gift or the gift giver? Right now, we have gifts that we're giving. And we give our gifts, why? Because we love the gift giver more than the gift that he gave us because we are stewards of our gifts, which means when God blesses us financially, when God blesses us with material things, if other people are in need, he gives us an overflow to make sure that we can give it to others. But God won't give you an overflow if he can't trust you to give out of that overflow when he instructs you to. So we were supposed to get hit by the storm, but by the grace and mercy of God, it missed us. So a lot of supplies that, was, that should have probably gone to Carolina because of the storm came here to Virginia. Why? Because they thought the storm was going to hit us. So because we've been so blessed, right now we're filling up one big truck right now, and we have other materials in there, and we'll send off another truck next week. We just thank God for the kingdom people who pay their tithes, the kingdom people who give, those people who are partnered with us from Virginia Beach all the way to Richmond. People will bring us supplies from Richmond. And we just thank you for showing us that it doesn't matter how bad this world seems, we still have people with a heart of compassion. So this right here is definitely a matter of the heart. And I thank my church. I thank my Tidewater Peninsula Baptist Association. Uh, colleagues, I thank the mayor of this great city and the city manager and the city council who partnered with us and helped us to send the trucks off. We just thank God that there's people of God planted everywhere in every facet of the world. If we didn't have godly, God-fearing people on the city council, I'm sure that we would have never been able to receive funds from them to send this shipment off. So we just thank God for each and every one of you all who participated in this endeavor. Serious matters of the heart again, part three again. We talked about uh, let it burn, and we that was when we talked about uh, Elisha burning his cattle in order to make sure he got rid of everything in his past. Uh, we talked about radical faith, and now today we're going to talk about who do you love more, the gift giver or the gift? What do you love more, uh, the gift giver or the gift? All right, look, look at here, Tom Rainer. 
In his book, I Will, he writes, I can't put a specific date on it. Smarter people than I have tried to explain it. Somewhere in the 20th century, believers particularly in America began to shift from an attitude of self-sacrificing service to God and worship of God to consumer-focused, self-serving attitudes. It has been a terrible shift. Some blame, is, uh, it, 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 some blame it on secularization of our culture. Others point to the degradation of theology in our churches. Still others say the local church, church leaders themselves have taken a corporate on corporate models and turned our churches into consumer-focused organizations. There is probably some truth in all three explanations, but there is one thing we can say with certainty. The focus in too many of our church worship services is not God. We are focused on ourselves, our own needs, and our own preferences. But even though most of us will wholeheartedly agree with Brother Rayner that we have become selfish and need to focus more on God. Most of us find ourselves in a paradoxical dilemma with the story of God calling Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. This directive of God is a tough pill to swallow. How could such a loving God even suggest such a thing? It's not just incomprehensible, it's absolutely unconscionable. But the Bible story that caused the most cognitive dissonance in our logical minds often contains the greatest revelations. Instead of dissecting Scripture, we need to let Scripture dissect us. Our thoughts, our attitudes, our dreams, our desires, our fears and hopes. Too often we approach stories like this one as if God is on trial, but it's not his character that is in question. It's our character that's on the stand. And this is precisely why God tests us. If you're around my age or older, you hear this message, you heard this message more than once. This is a test. For the next 60 seconds, 60 seconds the station will conduct a test of the emergency broadcast system. This is only a test. God never intended for Abraham to sacrifice his son. It was only a test. In fact, God would not have allowed the slaying of Isaac. He simply wanted to test Abraham to see if he was willing to obey the most counterintuitive command imaginable. Scripture explicitly reads, God tested Abraham and Abraham passed the test. That's how you get a testimony, no test. No testimony. You hear it right? Test a money. So the next time you are tested, recognize it for what it is. It's a simply an opportunity for you to get a testimony. You get testimonies when you're challenged, battered, and bruised. Testimonies are created in wilderness situations. Testimonies are created while you're chilling on the island in Jamaica, snipping on some Mai Tais. No, you don't get testimonies like that. You get testimonies when you get put through the ringer. You get testimonies when you go through hell and high water. You get testimonies when somebody tests your patience. You get testimony through bad times and not good times. That's where you get your testimonies from. So stop. Stop getting mad when you get a test. You need to just hold up holy hands and say, this too shall pass. God is just getting me ready so I can have a testimony to tell somebody how I made it over. God gave Abraham several different tests. This was the final. It was specifically designed to test whether or not Abraham was told, was sold out to God. God tests us for two primary reasons. First, it's an opportunity for God to prove himself to us. Second, it's an opportunity for us to prove ourselves to God. That's why we should consider it joy when we experience trials. They are the proving ground. They're, they're the way we graduate to the next level in God's kingdom. Uh, God doesn't have a no child left behind initiative like George Bush. You can, can be a Christian for 30 years and remain on the same level. Because you will, if you continue to fail the elevation test to advance to the next level, if you continue to fail, God will let you stay right there and operate on the same level. When Abraham raised the knife, God knew he was willing to sacrifice what was most precious to him. And then God proved himself to be 
Jehovah Jireh, Abraham's provider. If Abraham hadn't committed totally to the will of God, he would have robbed God of the opportunity to provide a ram in the thicket. God cannot reveal his faithfulness until we exercise our faith. Can I say that again? God cannot reveal his faithfulness until we exercise our faith. God will not tempt you. It's not in his nature. He even promises never to allow anything to be put on you more than you can handle. This is one of the reasons God doesn't elevate you to the next level when you do not pass the exam to be promoted to the next level. God won't tempt you, but he will indeed test you. And the tests don't get easier. They get progressively harder and harder. The same test you took in first grade, you didn't take in fifth grade. And the same test you took in fifth grade, you didn't take in the eighth grade. And the same test you took in the eighth grade, you didn't take in the twelfth grade. And the same test you took in the twelfth grade, you didn't take in college. And the same test you took in college, in undergrad, you didn't take in your graduate studies. What I'm telling you is, it's only going to get harder when you graduate to the next level. So that's why God doesn't let you elevate in the Bible. And some say, God does not let fruit grow on his vine before it's time. Why? He don't let you get elevated until you can handle the haters around you, until you can handle the challenges around you. If you can't ha- handle the handle, handle the haters that are coming at you at this level, it's funny how many people get mad when I talk about haters it's because you the hater and ain't got none why you always talking about haters really you saying why I'm always talking about you I just figured it out right now in the pulpit (laughs) because I ain't really talking about nobody individually I'm just telling it how it is I'm just telling you if you're doing something for God and you're going from one level of glory to the next you're going to have a higher test why? because the devil can only kill, steal and destroy he can't create more demons he can't send a general to you if it only takes a private to keep you in check he can't, he don't have any more soldiers he can make. He ain't got time to send a stronger demon at you if the weaker demon can handle it. So when you begin to get elevated, the next reward you're going to get is a bigger test. But just understand, he said, I'll give you a hundredfold in this lifetime with persecution. So if you got persecution, just look over at the stuff God has allowed you to accumulate. When you look at the haters that's coming against you, just look at the blessings he's stored upon you. Look at all the haters that say we wouldn't get in the building. And look at us sending trucks out to South Carolina. Look at us sending trucks out to North Carolina. Look at everybody talking about us. Remember last time we had to take up stuff? We had the whole building took up. We had to preach all over water because the building was so small. We couldn't even hardly have Sunday school. Had to put Dickens Bells out in the hallway to teach the young adults because the building was so small. But when they started talking about us, it was because we was going from one level to the next. If ain't nobody talking about you, I feel sorry for you because that means you ain't got nothing, not doing nothing. Jesus. And those tests that you get will undoubtedly revolve around what you, what is most important to you. He will test you in what you identify yourself in and what you find security in. He will test you with your eyes. God will test you to make sure your identity and security are rooted in the cross of Jesus Christ. God will go after anything you trust in more than him until you put it on the altar. You don't have to live in fear wondering if God is going to take away what is most important in you. Remember, Isaac was God's gift to Abraham. But if the gift ever becomes more important than the gift giver, then the very thing God gave you to serve, his purpose is undermining his plan for your life. When God is no longer uh, your everything and you begin to call on God uh, like a cook to order chef, it is the beginning of the end spiritually. God giving gifts are wonderful and dangerous at the same time. 
When we use them for his glory, they are wonderful. When we begin to use the gift for our own selfish gain or love the gift more than the gift giver, they become dangerous. Adam said, the woman you gave me made me do it. I believe that's why God say, a man that finds the wife, he ain't going to find it for you no more. You ain't going to blame him. <laughs> Everybody be talking about God send me this. You better go find somebody because at the end of the day, God said, ain't going to blame me for that no more. Hey, uh, Adam said, the lady you gave me, that woman you gave me, it's her fault. If you wouldn't have gave her to me, I would have still been all right, sinless in the garden. I was doing good, God, till you gave me that lady. He put his blessing before the blessor. Can I kind of talk to some people? And I know I ain't, you know, walk down the aisle or somebody walk down the aisle to me, but can I talk to you for a minute if it's married folk? When y'all say happy wife, happy life, that ain't biblical. <laughs> that, ain't, that ain't biblical. Happy, happy wife, happy life. Sometimes if you're the man of God, you might upset her because you got to tell her what to do somewhere else. Come on, somebody. I, I know y'all, y'all smiling, that little crazy smile. You're going to get me in trouble, Pastor. <laughs> See, happy life, happy wife. Happy wife, happy life didn't work, did it? Adam got kicked out of the garden. God, that's a whole other sermon right there. <laughs> He got kicked out of the garden because he was talking about happy wife, happy life. Now, yes, you should make your wife happy, but you need to serve God first and foremost. If you start putting your wife and your husband before God, God will make sure he step in the midst of that because he won't have anything being an idol, not even your spouse. Adam was the first one saying happy wife, happy life. He got kicked out of the garden. <laughs> Jesus, help me. Anyway, if you have a dream <laughs> and it dies, it may be God testing you to see what is more important to you, the dream or him. Which do you love more, the dream God gave you or the God who gave you the dream? Is your dream a means of glorifying God or is your dream the end goal and God is the means of fulfilling it? God-ordained dreams aren't just born, they're reborn. If they become more important to you than God, you have to sacrifice them for the sake of your soul. You have to put them on the altar and raise the knife. And once your dream is dead and buried, it can be resurrected for God's glory. Look, 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 look. It, it, it can be resurrected when I first... I started in touch and it began to get big with the people who wanted to do it. Before we even started it, I was like, man, am I trying to do this to get attention? I had been trying to take it to other people. They didn't want to do it. And I let it go. And then I let it go. I said, you know what? I'm not going to do it. I sent an email to people. I was working on some stuff. I had went out to Mexico or somewhere. Uh, t Nims had sent me. And then I, I was chilling. And I sent an email saying, I'm not going to do this in touch thing. I'm not sure if this is of God or if it's me want to just be seen. And then I got an email back and a phone call from Sarge of the police uh, department said, no, nah, man, you got to do this. This is something big. You got to do it. And I just felt like that was God saying, okay, dude, go ahead and do it. If you was going to give it up, I'll bless it. Ooh. The Holy Spirit is the dream maker. Just as he hovered over the chaos at the dawn of creation, he overshadows all creation. The Holy Spirit is the one who spawns the thought that creates the dream inside of you. That's why you got to be careful and put God first. He gave you the idea. If you nurture the thought with prayer and remain in agreement with the Holy Spirit, it will become a God-sized dream. See, I would rather have a God idea than a thousand good ideas. See, good ideas are good. But God ideas transform communities and change the course of history. You can get good ideas from a lot of different places, but God ideas only come from one place, the Holy Spirit. Isaac was God's idea. It was God who proclaimed the promise of Abraham and conceived the promise with Sarah. Postmenopausal 
octogenarians do not have children, ever. You understand what I'm saying? If you're 80 years old and then I've been through menopause or in menopause, you ain't having no baby. But God always delivers what he conceives if we're willing to go through the labor pains. Can you go through the labor pains? Can you go through the, through the, through the, through the, through the, through the turmoil? Can you go through when people get on your nerves? Can you go through when people attack you? Can you go through the hate? Can you go through the failures? Can you go through the public embarrassment and still give birth because you don't abort the process? <clears throat> Look here, let me tell you this about <coughs> making sure you don't get too excited about stuff. I'm a passionate preacher and teacher, all right? But I rarely get excited about anything, rarely. Mama get mad because I don't ever get excited because I always expect God to bless me. Just, just who I am. I'm not emotional. And I believe most leaders, or good leaders, aren't emotional. They even kill people because you can't get too happy and you can't get too sad. Get too happy, you'll stop working. Or you'll just think you all that. Get too sad, you'll stop working too because you're depressed and scared to fail. So I'm mostly an even keel person. I rarely get excited. But when I got called to pass, I was excited because God had been calling me to do all this stuff and I ain't never get it. I was like, man, you sure, man? Leave this alone. And I got called here. But the thing about it is some pastors and some of us may even allow our church to become an idol. Y'all know what I'm saying? Not even just pastors. You know why some people still mad about 326? It became an idol. We got us in this building. My name on it. Right on the cornerstone where Jesus' name should be. Ah, this is my building. I put that pew right there. And we began to get so excited about something, we begin to think we own it. And I'm beginning to talk to one of my, I talked to one of my trustees the other night, and he was talking about some, sometimes when I would preach about something and I would be mad. Let me tell you something. I've only been mad in one sermon. And that was somewhere else on an away game. It wasn't even a home game. Now I'm passionate. And see, the thing about it, I'm passionate when God giving you good news, I'm passionate when God giving you bad news. But if this was an idol, I preach to you what I want. I make you happy all the time. If it was an idol when God gave me a word of correction to you, I still preach a good word like Joe Osteen so somebody else can see me on YouTube and call me to another church. I ain't stupid. If I'm mad and I want to leave, well, I'm going to preach a mad sermon. Ain't nobody else going to want me. I'm a strategic person. I ain't stupid. I'm not emotional when it comes to decisions. Some folk would have got cut three, four, five, six, seven years ago. I would have cut so many leaders if I didn't just sit down and let God do it strategically. Pow, pow, pow. <laughs> but I'm not emotional. And I don't own nothing. So I can only do it in God's timing. But if I really felt like this was mine, I would preach what I wanted and make everybody happy. And what I would always get mad at, Brother Ricks, every time right around my dad gone church, my pastor's anniversary, God would have me doing some mean type sermons or, or some stern sermons for better. I'm like, come on, man. I'm trying to get some money from these people. I'm trying to get some good presents. And here you go with some stern word. Can you wait till after I get my presents, God? Can I keep it real? Since people think that I get up here and be upset, that be God on you. And see, this is the whole thing I need to tell you right now. The thing about it is you don't need to worry when God is chastising you when you out of, when you out of order. You need to get scared when he stops. That means he ain't studying you no more. He like you beyond repentance. Anyway, back to what I was talking about. You got to understand that you don't own nothing. Everything you have is a byproduct of the gifts and talents God gave you. He's the one that gave you the power to obtain wealth. You don't own that car. It's God's car. You don't own that house. It's God's house. 
The reason why some of us don't tithe, the reason why some of us don't give, the reason why some of us didn't bring anything to go to North Carolina or send a donation is because we think we own the money that's in our pocket. You don't own anything. The gift giver gave you the gift and the power to obtain wealth. That is not your money. You are a steward of his money. Anyway, every, in fact, when you give your life to Jesus, the possessor pronoun is eliminated from your vocabulary. There's no more me, my, or mine. It ain't yours. This ain't your church. It ain't your house. It's not your car. You are a steward. That means you don't own it, God owns it, but he's trusting you to use it the way he's, the purpose that he's given it to you for. Look at this, and I'm a Baptist, but I just want to talk about something the Methodists said, all right? The early Methodists devoted themselves entirely to God with a covenant prayer. The prayer goes like this, I'm no longer my own, but thine. Put me to what thou wilt. Rank me with whom thou wilt. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be employed or for thee or laid aside for thee, exalted for thee or brought low for thee. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Me Hello, I'm Pastor Willard Maxwell of New Beach Grove. And I just wanted to let you know, I believe that God is speaking directly to us through this ministry. And I believe that there may be some messages that you've missed that are life changing for you and you need to take the time to order. Or maybe there's some message that you heard that you know a friend or, or a co-worker or a family member, even an enemy's life may be changed. And let me tell you this, in the Bible it says, don't stack up treasures here on earth that the moth will eat or the water will wash away. It says stack up your treasures in heaven where they, eat, where they will last for eternity. John says in my father's house there's many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. What I'm telling you is this, the way you stack up your crown and build your mansions in heaven is when you give a life-changing word to someone or share salvation. You don't have to be the one bringing the word. You can just buy the word and send it to someone and you're stacking up treasures in heaven. I'm believing that you're going to make the right decision and you're going to get this series or get a CD or get a DVD for somebody. It's going to be life-changing and instead of building up treasures here on earth, you're going to take the time to build up the treasures in eternity where you will live with your Father forever. Be blessed.